Hey everybody, welcome to Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt. And I'm Tyler. Alright, welcome to the Linux Cast. This is where we talk about Linuxy things. And that's why there's Linux in the title of the show. It's actually the name of the channel as well, which, you know, I've you know, I've considered changing the name of the channel just so that the podcast could be its own thing, because it doesn't really make sense for a YouTube channel to be called a cast all the time, but at this point I've pretty much it's the brand to be like changing the name of DistroTube, it'd be really weird. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, turns out it's going to stay the same. But anyways, I'm a little rambly today because I have things to say. Also, words are effing hard, so expect me to ramble and and awe and um. And I'm so sorry, Nate. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> this is going to be bad, man. This is going to be bad. I'm just going to say it. All right. Anyways, so today we're going to be talking about a fantastic topic that's sure to piss no one off ever everyone will agree with the things that we have to say today but Mm -hmm. before we get into that we're going to talk about what we've done this week in open source but i'm going to actually before before we do that before tyler goes i'm going first because i got some shit to talk about so first just as a rant about obs i love obs obs is a fantastic piece of software it's the shining example of what open source can do for a broader more well-used community i think that more people should use obs i think that it's awesome and you should contribute to it if you have some money throw them some money or do some contributing or do some documentation whatever it's a fantastic piece of software also it's a piece of shit Uh, (laughs) also it's just there are little things in obs that just piss me off mainly the biggest one is that your transforms don't stay the same like i don't know we do this podcast once a week it's all i use this particular sync collection for I don't use it for anything else. I just use it for when we do the podcast. And every single week, without exception, I come back and the transforms are different. And it's not just like because the class names of the windows that I'm capturing are different, which they're not. They're exactly the same every single week. Don't change the podcast name. It's always called the Linux Cast. The, the room we're doing this in is always called the Linux Cast. So that doesn't change. Yet, every single time I come in here, and it doesn't matter... It, it, It doesn't matter that the fact that the windows are actually the same size each week because I always have the same split just for this reason. Because if you have the windows a different size, then the video is a different size in the Discord window and then your transforms would then be different, right? But they're exactly the same size every week. And yet, every time I have to come in here, I have to fix Tyler's transform because there's always a little green bar above him or, you know, there's a black bar along the side and it drives me bonkers it drives me absolutely nuts like <laughs> this can't possibly be that hard like it can't po- like it's a yaml file it is a yaml file i'm pretty sure where, where all this stuff is stored is like a yaml file or something like that and I, it's not like i'm going in there and, and changing the yaml file midweek just to mess around with my transforms it drives me bonkers and I want it to change. I, I wish I wish I knew enough code to actually, you know, go fix it myself. Because apparently this is a problem that they don't see. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one that experiences this problem. But uh, yeah, that's that. I, I hate it so much, and it drives me absolutely fucking insane. And I want to murder it with. Uh, it, well, fireworks. like let's be honest. Anybody, anybody who watches this podcast and the, you know, the like live part where we're doing it live, the pre-show knows exactly how much you hate having to change the transforms in OBS. Literally every week. Literally. Like, like I told Tyler this before, right before we started recording. If we could just have one week, I could just one week where I could open up OBS, change to the sync collection that I always use, and it just be exactly the way it was when I left it because I, I don't do anything to it in between. Like there's a week between podcasts. I don't go into that scene collection at all because I use a different scene collection to do my videos. It's c- completely different and they're different sources. So I made sure all the sources were differently named because I thought figure at one point I figured it was because I'm using the same like, like for webcam. I usually just used to call it just webcam in both scene collections. So I figured if I did a transform on my webcam in one scene collection, it transform, tr- you know, transitioned into the other sync collection so maybe that's the reason why I, my transforms were different but no i changed it so that in every sync collection every source is named differently so that that can't possibly happen yet today when i logged in not only were you 
different. Like, I had a green bar, so I had to change that transform, which shouldn't be there, because it should be exactly the same as it was last week. But I was, my webcam was at 680 by, six, some 600 by 480 or something like that. Like, first off, great resolution from the 90s, but we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> as Tyler's joke was going on, you know, but it's just, it's just, it's, it's infuriating and I needed to get it off my chest. The other thing that I want to talk about was Wayland itself. So I like uh, Wayland now uh, a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. I've really been enjoying Hyperland mostly. That's the reason why I like, have been okay with Wayland. Hyperland is a fantastic window manager. But the portal, this portal situation is going to be the reason I go back to x -Work. I almost guarantee it. It's infuriating where, for whatever reason, it either the portal will crash like it did just a few minutes ago, or every time I open up OBS in order to record my main screen, which is the one that sits in front of me, I have two, mon two monitors on top of each other over here, and then I have the main screen here. It will record the two monitors over here just fine, no matter what. This one over here, in order to get to record it, I have to restart the portal service, the, the system D service for the portal. And I don't know why. And I, I've been, t I've, you know, I've been talking on Git, GitLab or GitHub with, uh, on, the, on the Hyperlam GitHub with them. And we've been trying to get through it. And we don't know what's going on there. But it's infuriating. And it's just, it's just like these little pain points of everything that just drive me bonkers this week and uh, I, I needed to rant at you guys for a little while about that so if you guys see me back on xmonad in like half a day <laughs> that's the reason why unfortunately i've gone through and, and tr basically transformed everything on my system that couldn't work with wayland into things that work with wayland so like i switched from rofi to rofi wayland and now anytime i decide i need to go back into xorg for whatever reason because i still have X xmonad and, and qtile and stuff installed and I do a, like a, a, a Super D in order to get to Rofi. It won't work because Rofi Wayland doesn't work on XOR. So going back is going to be a pain in the fucking ass. And I don't want to do it because I like Hyperland a little bit. But also, Waybar. Guys, I hate Waybar with a passion, actually. Why? It's the buggiest. It's like the KDE devs decided to make a bar. It's the buggiest piece of garbage I've ever seen in my life. All right. For me. What bugs are you having? For me. Okay. So right now, actually... You guys can actually see this. I'll, I'll show you my cam. Let's see if... Actually, I can't show you my cam because the fucking portal is frozen again. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Anyways, in Waybar, I have the Hyperland workspaces in the middle section, right? You can't see it because it it's not going through. But anyways, in the middle section, and for whatever reason, it shows sometimes, not always... The, the special workspace where I have my scratch pads. Okay. And whatever. I, I, if I, that's a bug I could put up with because I can just restart way bar if I want to get rid of them. It shouldn't be, it, it should go away when the scratch pad's not on screen or it shouldn't be there at all because there's actually a setting in way bar that says do not show special or something like that. I have that set perfectly fine. It doesn't work for me. I don't know why. But the weird thing is that every once in a while, uh, along the side of the workspace part of the bar, I get this little blank space. It looks like extra padding, like along the side. It's not there always, it's just there sometimes. But what it is actually is, is a blank workspace with no name, but it has a name if you click on it. It'll actually take you to a workspace that doesn't exist called negative 1337. I have pictures of this. You can't make this shit up. It actually is there. And uh, I've <laughs> I made a bug report on the Waybar uh, Git page, and <laughs> his response was that it must be CSS. So I uploaded my CSS, and he says, "Well, I can't reproduce it, so it's not CSS." And I'm actually, and so we couldn't figure fix that either. And it keeps crashing, and I'm looking for a new bar. So yeah, I'm, I'm having problems i'm moving to windows i, I guess is, is the problem 
Every, Very and, odd. And everyone else says that Waybar is fantastic and that it doesn't never crash on them and they don't have any of these problems. Like Fraggle yeah. uses some of the same stuff when he uses a bar, he uses some of the same stuff that I do. He uses the same things for, for scratch pads, I think, as I do. And he doesn't have any of the same problems. Now, he doesn't have multiple screens, so maybe this is a multiple bar problem because I have a bar on each screen, so maybe that's what's causing it. I don't know. It, it's, I think multiple screens. How about this? After this podcast, you're sending me your config and your style CSS, and I'm going to test and see and also look into it because I want to know what settings you may have set differently the, than me. They're all up on GitLab, of course, and you'll have to install Piperland because that's what I use for scratch pads. So, well, I don't even know how to use scratch pads, so that one's going to be a hard one for me to reproduce. Yeah, so. well, uh, it's it, it's fine. I, I just have a key binding. Where, so I can actually, what I should do is tie this key binding to the portal, so that it just restarts the portal every time I restart Waybar, and <laughs> I should just do that. There you go. I, I, I can just do because I do that four times a day to get rid of the stuff that mysteriously shows up in in Waybar. Also, my cam is still frozen, <laughs> which is just the, the stupidest thing. Actually, let me let me go ahead and restart the portal. Just I, I have this thing here, and we can see if that fixes it. And no, it didn't fix it. <laughs> okay uh anyways that's enough of me ranting <laughs> tyler what have you been doing on open source this week hopefully having a better luck than i have <laughs> actually uh yeah uh, about 10 times better luck i've gotten a ton of stuff so i even I, I i even spent some time looking at and trying to help you address some issues on your dot files but i i've gotten my my zany os or like nix os configuration is pretty much ready for a stable release i've got plenty of easy configuration options for like you know do you want bloated programs installed like caden live blender that i use so you can easily toggle those on and off do you want ntp services like i've got a whole bunch of different easy options that you can set my configuration we also have thanks to jerry uh, ddubs and a handful of other people we've added a whole bunch of features like choosing you know you can easily switch out your kernel for something like the Zan mod kernel. You can easily do that. Zen kernel. So, oh, I'm frozen. I again. know, I'm fixing it. Okay. But, um, yeah, and yeah. then I've also got... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to let it out. It was fucking stupid thing. <laughs> it's, it's bullying you. It's not fair. It worked it's not fine. Fair. It worked fine last week. Like last week, I was on on Wayland. All right, sorry. You can you can keep, just keep going. It, I'll keep fixing it as long as I need to, and then I'll, I'll mess around with it later. So the other thing that we've pretty much decided, and kind of everybody who's been helping out with my configurations and making pull, uh, excuse me, merge requests and issues. We've all kind of agreed. We've hit a really nice point with my configuration. There's a lot of options. So now the only thing that we're going to work on is I'm going to do a stable release either before or after we make an install slash manager script where you won't have to go through a whole bunch of steps to reproduce the system or anything like that. You'll literally just execute a script and that script will not only install the flake and set up your system, your Nix OS configuration to work properly with flakes and, you know, set anything that you might need for mine. It'll do health checks to make sure you've, you've, you're actually using GPT and U, UEFI. Cause that's a, that's a pretty common thing that people do is accidentally install using legacy or MBR and Nix OS does not like that especially when you're using experimental features like flakes, it definitely doesn't like it. So for things like that, it'll have health checks to make sure it's running on a proper system. And then also if you're running inside of an X or a Wayland session, you'll also, I'm going to use YAD to give you a GUI front end for configuring options and stuff. So for the people who want my configuration, but are not interested in learning how it works, are not interested in learning how Nix OS works in general, all of that kind of stuff. If you don't want any of that, but you just want my configuration and you want to change a few things about it, maybe install a new program, you know, 
do whatever, you'll have that easy tool there and it'll work under any environment, whether it be X, Wayland, or just in a TTY. So that's kind of the big thing I've been working on and planning out. It's pretty much what I've been up to. Just a whole bunch of NixOS work. You're, you've become the ultimate NixOS fanboy. This is what you've become. I, I genuinely love it. Like I, and I, I wouldn't say that I love NixOS as much as I love the Nix programming language. It's really awesome. Like I really do like it. The only thing that I will say is it is, there's a lot, a lot of um, curly brackets for me. Uh, it's a little too close to like something like Lisp and its parentheses, in my opinion. So maybe that could be improved, but overall, I love it. It's nice. It's got a decent syntax. I like it. Thank you, the Linux Tube, for your five dollars super chat, and I will indeed buy myself a shot. <laughs> I'm gonna need one by the end of this. I'm, I have a feeling I'm gonna be starting the portal several more times. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, but yes, thank well, you for that. <laughs> Also, when it comes to your Waybar configuration, I don't. I had an issue with Waybar and it having a bug, and I will, I will laugh if the same thing happened to you that's happening to me because I can't remember what it was. I either misspelled an option or put something ridiculous in for a setting, and it broke like something completely different, and it took me forever to find what I was doing wrong in my Waybar. Okay, so th this is the argument I had with the Waybar dev. Okay, so if, if this happened all the time. Then it was de then it's definitely something that I did in my configuration file, definitely. But it doesn't happen all the time. It just pops up after suspend, okay? And it's not always after suspend, it's, but it's mostly after the computer comes back from suspend. It will put this thing up there, and it's really fucking weird. It, 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 right now, after I restarted Raybar, it's not there. It's gone. And if it was in, if it was in the configuration file, it would be there always. So I don't know. It's weird. It's not that big of a deal. There are other bars. Like, I have a couple of the bars open here that I've been meaning to look at. There's one called Iron Bar that looks okay. It's also done by CSS and stuff. So, some of the knowledge that I've been relearning is not going to be completely gone. Both of these are GTK. GTK, there's another one called G Bar that looks not quite as good as, mm -hmm. as Iron Bar does. Also, someone says, well, why don't you just use EU? And I'm like, EU... <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. Ooh is nice, but I haven't had time to play around with it. And it's, it is way, like you think Waybar is difficult to configure? Good luck. Tr try Ooh. Have I've fun. I've tried. Have I did, fun. I did a whole um, live stream on it and I didn't get very far, but I need to get, because you go on Unix porn, you see people who've done that stuff with, with you and like, oh, that looks really freaking awesome, right? And I want to do that. At least I can steal someone else's config for it. And use it then and learn it from there. But it's just, I don't know, it's very, very complicated. But anyways, I, I'm going to be in search for a new bar. I'm not leaving Wayland or Hyperland because of the stupid portal thing. It's not that big of a deal. Well, I, I do have to say this. The portal issues are the one things that people run into with Wayland. That's typically your last barrier to entry where it's perfect. And the portal issues are terrible. And this is kind of a self-promotion, but not really, because I do actually mean this. You are, I believe, on Patreon in a support tier. I'm pretty sure. So that means you have time. Like, you've been paying for a long time, so you, you have time. Like, I give time freely that you can book time for me to do stuff for you. So if you want an Ubar, but you don't want to write it yourself, book the time for me to do it for you. That's kind of what they're there for. So just so everybody knows, like uh, Steve in chat was talking about it, but like if you want me to do something like build you a Nix OS configuration, build you a module configuration, I have support tiers where you can schedule time and you get a certain amount of time each week that you're subscribed that you can schedule out for me to do stuff for you. And that's kind of the point of doing it. I, I want to provide that service for other people. Also, it, it's kind of a cheat because it also means I make a little bit of money for learning things that I should just spend my free time learning already. <laughs> but, you know, you should you should drop your link to your Patreon in the in the chat. Steve, thanks for the super chat, bud. A bar of soap. Have a Kahlua shot and relax, bud. I don't think I've ever had Kahlua, to be honest with you. Like even when I drank anything, like all back in, in the got it. It's been o over 10 years since I've had any, anything to, to drink. <laughs>
I don't think I've ever had Kahlua, like a Kahlua shot. I've had Kahlua. My mom likes Kahlua in her coffee. Like if she's got a day off, she has nothing to do. She'll put a little bit of Kahlua in her coffee. But like I've had that. That's good. I don't, I don't know about a Kahlua shot straight up. I've never had that. I used to stock it when I worked at a grocery store. So uh, that's probably about as close, as close to Kahlua as I've ever gotten. So, all right. So... <laughs> As you can tell, we, we we've had some we've had some things to talk about, but we're gonna go ahead and move into the main topic, which, by the way, is gonna piss everyone off, <laughs> like everyone yes. off. So, last week we did our Linux tears, and by the way, that was the most viewed podcast we've ever had on the channel. So, th- if you wa- if you watched that, thank you so very much for watching it. And we know why, because it literally pissed everybody off. Like, I don't think anybody said like, oh yeah, I agree with you 100% on everything, which we didn't expect people to agree. But the number of people who were confused as to what that was, I think they thought that we were trying to make like the be all end all tier list that was like set in stone, nobody could disagree with. Guys, that was opinion. Like every single thing we said there was an opinion. And like all opinions, it could be wrong, you know, we have opinions that are wrong all the time. So the number of people that we offended on that video and on that podcast was extraordinary. If you want to have an immense amount of fun reading a comment section, go read the comment section of that video because goodness gracious, people, people were very offended. Surprisingly, I didn't lose subscribers on that actually gained. That was a net positive for, for subscribers. But, but the number of people who said that like, I, I don't agree with you on Pop! OS, they said it was either going to be low. Some people said Pop! OS was too low. Some people were. And goodness gracious, the people who said that we did Arch a bad, we just did Arch yeah. bad, was uh, off the charts. So just to can, cut can I ask you one thing though before we dive into this? Do you remember off the top of your head, or could you look up what was the like to dislike ratio on that video? Oh, I can. Yeah, I, I can go. I can go look. So let's see. So on on the edited version, the we had three hundred and eight likes and thirty two dislikes. So not okay. too bad. On the live, we had. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't show on the live. Oh, yeah, it does. We had 132 likes and eight dislikes, so not too bad. Uh, I thought okay. it, was, it would actually be higher. Uh, uh, yeah. Also, by the way, just a reminder: if you're watching this live, hit the thumbs up button. Uh, hashtag, hashtag YouTuber. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I can go back here. Well, actually, I got to be honest. Some people will say will complain that you don't or that you do say it, and then there's people like Hip Dad who I can't remember which podcast it was I don't, I don't think it was our last one but he was like he was like are you kidding me like this many people in here and there's only like four likes like <laughs> he's like just talk about it tell people to like it everyone forgets he's like i'm forgetful anyways leave a like we'd, re- we'd really appreciate it but anyways just to compound on our error quote unquote error with arch we decided we're going to dedicate a whole podcast to talking about whether or not arch is a good distribution so I think you and I would both agree, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think we'd both agree that Arch at one point was our favorite distro between you and me. You used Arch a yes. lot. You always returned to Arch despite the Josh-like distro hopping that you used to do. And I was an Arch fanboy for a very long time because it was good. So we were we both come at this as someone who, who has used Arch extensively uh, for a very long time, right? So we've we, we, uh, one of the primary criticisms we had from last week was that we ranked distros that we hadn't used, which, by the way, was blatantly untrue. I used every single distro that we ranked. Maybe not for very long, but I've used them. That's how I had the logos of them, okay? Because I've made videos about those. Okay, so that's how that, that I didn't go. I, I didn't actually go out and search out one single logo. I had all those on my computer. So that criticism wasn't very good, but. When it comes I mean, to- towards me, it works because there was like two or three that I that I had never used. But I don't even think that's a valid argument because like, <laughs> OK, you, you've ever had. So if you've ever been into sports and you've had a girlfriend while you were into, into sports, you'll know that oftentimes they'll mock you for doing like March Madness brackets. And uh-huh. they I, I had one girlfriend who decided to do a March, ba- March Madness bracket with me and decided to choose the teams based on how cute the coach was. She had no clue, by the way, who any of the teams were or any of the players or if they were good or bad. She just 
looked up a picture of the coach and made, and that's how she picked the winners. The the sad thing is she did a better job than I did. She actually had more wins <laughs> than I did. So it was absolutely hilarious. But anyway, <laughs> that's absolutely beside the point. A- a- anyways, we both come at the arts thing from experience. So we can't the key, you can't say that we don't have experience with arts, but we have to ask the question these days. Now that we have things like Nyx and other distrobes that are, you know, immutable and stuff like that, that it, we we have other things. Do we think that Arch is still a top tier Linux distro like it has been in the past? So Tyler, I'm gonna let you go and go first. Actually, about th- about this question, what do you think? I'd have to say it is a good distro. Like objectively, it's a good distro. For most people, though, I don't think. I don't think that's true. Like it used to be Arch was really good because if you wanted up to date packages, like truly up to date packages, Arch was the way to go. Arch also did not have too steep of a learning curve. There there is a learning curve. There's no lie about that, but it wasn't as steep as something like Gentoo. Like sure, you can get up to date packages with Gentoo, but do you have the time to compile and learn how Portage works? Probably not. So I I think Arch served a really, really big niche inside of Linux. But now if you want up-to-date packages and you want a lot of packages, the AUR is not the only place to go to anymore. I mean, most distributions, you can get pretty new packages pretty easily from a repository, a community repository that is essentially a copy of the AUR. Essentially. I don't think, I don't think it serves that, that niche the same anymore, mainly because there is constant issue. We've got Steve in the chat. Just spend a moment of your time joining in and listening to Steve talk about all the things he's had to fix in Arch to make sure it works properly for everybody that uses Zero Linux. Like, spend time talking to people who have done this stuff. Arch breaks a lot. I don't know if everybody remembers it, but there was a time where their C tool chain was like, how far out of date? Like, what was it, like years? Yeah, like, it, it was, was a bad. long time, yeah. Because cause the... So... Like, the person who was maintaining it wasn't around anymore, we didn't want to do it or something. It was it was a weird situation. I know Brody covered it several times. Yeah. And I I, th- I, I, I think Arch is in this, like, unique space where it's it's not like they're they're a bad distro now. It's It's that a lot of the people who used to maintain and work on Arch have went to other places and are doing other things in other like communities inside of Linux. And I I think that will probably be the problem of Arch for a long time is maintaining the actual, not just the system, but the packages inherently dependent on the system. There's just, people are going other places. There's a lot of other stuff that that is more stable than Arch. And then there's also Arch derivatives that are more stable than Arch. Sorry, Mandraro, you're not included in that, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, so he, you make a lot of good points. And I think that the biggest one that I want to talk about, pull out there, is the AUR. Because, okay, so if, for the longest time, there were two reasons why you'd want to use Arch. Two real, re- well, three, re- three real reasons. The first one was the installation. You wanted to be able to brag about the fact that you installed Arch because Arch was one of the harder distros to install. You had to know your stuff, right? It wasn't as hard as Gen 2 or Linux from scratch, but it was, you know, it was up there. No longer the case, but whatever. The, the second reason why you'd want to use Arch is that it's a rolling release. That means that you get a very early access to basically every package out there. And the third one, and, and I think probably the biggest one, was the AUR. You had access to this gigantic community repository that literally had every piece of software you could possibly want in it. And that was awesome. For many, many years, that's the reason why I used Arch was because the AUR was so damn good. But I think that f- two things. One you said, w- one thing you said was that that type of community repository is no longer all that special because of things like Flatpak and Snap and because of things like the Open Build Service or Copper. Uh, all these things exist, right? 
so it's not as special as it once was. But also, the Arch user repository suffers from the same problem that every community repository suffers from. Things like PPA suffered from it, the Open Build Service suffers from it, Copper suffers from it, the AUR suffers from it, is that people don't maintain their packages forever. And when they stop maintaining them, you end up with a ton of orphan packages, and they just live there forever until the arch, the, the moderators of the AUR decide to kick them off. And unfortunately, they can't keep up with it. So you end up with a situation... You know, I, I would say of, of the community repositories, the AUR does the best job of pruning the orphan packages of all the rest of them. Because like the, the open build service on OpenSUSE is just full of packages that are just completely out of date. And you know, they don't go away. I don't even know if they moderate the open build service, to be honest with you. I assume that they don't, seeing as how all the packages that I see there are really fucking old. Same thing with the copper. The, the same thing with the copper from Fedora is that you have a, a whole bunch of stuff there that's just really old. So I will say that the AUR does a better job of pruning that stuff, but because it's filled with a bunch of software that is still orphaned or really old or just significantly far behind, it takes away some of the luster, I think, that the AUR once had. Now, to answer the overall question, is Arch Linux good? I would say, yes, it is a good distro, but it's not a special distro anymore. Like, it used to feel like a special distro. Like, if you used Arch, you felt special because you used Arch. There's a reason why Arch Linux, I used Arch Linux, by the way, exists. Some of that was the installation. Maybe even most of that was the installation. But even when the Arch install script came along, you know, people were still very pleased with the fact that they were on Arch and they used Arch. They maintained Arch. I feel like some of that specialness has worn off a little bit. Maybe it's because I'm more cynical or been around the Linux community for long enough now to realize that Arch is just basically another distro. It's There's not much there that sets it apart from anything else. Uh, maybe I'm being too harsh on it because I am a, an entitled millennial and uh, I, I want them want uh, you know special shiny things all the time and whatever. Maybe that's a possibility. So it, it, this it's possible that my view on Arch is a little bit you know weird, but it just doesn't feel as special as it once did. What do you think of that? Well, I I would agree. Like I mean. It, it is very much true. There's, there's not, there's, there isn't like it used to be when you said you were running Arch or you were using Arch, not in the typical way we're talking about. Like I use Arch, by the way. Like, but when you're talking about you using Arch, normally with that came an inherent level of like Linux knowledge. Like if you were using Arch, that means you were at least to a moderate degree knowledgeable in how to set up and use an, a Linux system. Nowadays, that's not true. Like if you can install Arch through a script and through a ton of different ways and saying you use Arch or talking about how you're, how you're doing something in Arch or whatever doesn't include this inherent like knowledge of Linux. And I think that's why a lot of people like it's not as special anymore because you don't have to learn a lot about a Linux system to use it. And I think that's a, a big reason why Li Arch Linux was talked about so much. Like, because if you wanted to learn to use a Linux system, that's what you picked, at least most people. Yeah. Especially if you wanted to learn how to use a Linux system and also do it in a way where you could use it and not like, you know, if you've got a laptop going the Gentoo route, sure, you'll learn how to use a lot of more advanced things about Linux, how Linux operates. But at the end of the day, most people can't wait the time to do all that, to have a working system. So, but now there's, uh, I, I don't think Arch serves that same purpose as, as well anymore. Most people who are going to install Arch understand that there's there's problems you're going to run into that aren't necessarily have anything to do with your skill like they could just be inherent arch problems so to avoid that what do most people do you go and install arco you go and install endeavor you go and install an arch based derivative that takes care of those annoying problems for you that have nothing to do with skill at all and to me that's that's 
kind of an improvement. I think Arch as a base becoming less and less popular means more people are using really good derivatives like Arco, like Endeavor. Yeah, I, th I think that some of the issues that they have, because I, I think I've come down to this after using OpenSUSE now for well over 200 days, and the way OpenSUSE does a rolling release has kind of changed my mind on, on rolling releases. So Arch is literally no gap between when the developer presses publish and it comes to you. You get it the day that it's published to you. I don't think anymore that that's the best way to do a rolling release. It's just not. Now I'm, I, I don't want to come off and say like, oh man, Jaro is a fantastic distro. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a good distribution, but the, the general idea of a rolling release that holds things back just a little bit that tests just a little bit is much more appealing to me nowadays than a distribution that just gives me everything the day that it comes out because i i think that by delaying things just a little bit by allowing just a little bit of testing you get past so many game breaking bugs like releasing grub and it being broken you know, that didn't happen on distributions that did a little bit of testing. It's, you know, and the thing is that Arch breaks Grub all the time. It's just one of those things that gr that Arch does. And usually you can fix it fairly well by either holding the package back or, you know, not using the Git version, which is what they se seem to do, you know, for whatever reason. You know, so that early access to all the packages, I don't think for most people is the best way to do it. Now... That being said, some people don't mind. Like it, it's basically a package. Te for, for me, it, what it looks like is that Arch has become a package testing distro. If you want to help test packaging and the packages of, of your favorite software, Arch is probably the best way to do it because that's where you're going to get the most recent version of everything. And you'll have access to all the Git versions and stuff in the AUR. If you are more interested in a distribution that is stable, but isn't quite as old and crusty as Debian or Ubuntu or whatever, you're going to use a distribution that is rolling, like, you know, OpenSUSE or Fedora, but holds things back. Now, it doesn't mean that OpenSUSE or Fedora and distributions like that are perfect. They're absolutely not. I have many problems with, with, with both of them. But I, I think that for most people, a little bit of added security in, in those packaging, not security as in like secure, but security as in knowledge that it's going to actually work and not kill your system. I, reliability. I, yeah, reliability is, is a good thing for most people. And I, I think that people who tend to proselytize Arch as being like the best distro tend to confuse their use case of it and their willingness to maintain it with other people's willingness to, to maintain it because those aren't equal all the time. So just because you're interested in be, and okay with being basically a guinea pig for testing new packages, which is fine, you know, fine. That's, that's what you want to do. And that's the way you enjoy using your computer. That's 100% fine. But for a lot of people, what they really want to do is just use their computer and know that the next time I turn my computer on it's and do an update, it's not going to automatically not work because, you know, Grub didn't work or they killed System D or whatever. You know, it, I think that that's where most people are. Yeah. And I, I would agree with that. There's two comments in chat that like, I think we should probably address just because they're, they add on to this conversation pretty well. But to your point, I think a lot of people want up-to-date packages, but not the latest bleeding edge package. Arch for a long time was good for that. Like no, normally Arch doesn't pull from the literal latest commit from source. Sometimes it does, not always. And most people, if you set up a Linux system where it's pulling one of the latest commits, it doesn't have to be the latest commit from a, from a pack or for, from upstream, then you're fine. For most people, that's all they want. They want a late, the, they want the latest package that is known to be stable. They don't want the latest package, period, like the latest build. And so I, I'm not, that has nothing to say that like, or that's not me saying Arch is bad or good in that area. I just think that's what most people want. They want that reliability with it having the latest features, not being on a dev branch. I, I think something we need to be very 
open about is that neither one of us are saying that Arch is bad. So if if anybody in the chat says, well, you th you're saying Arch is bad. No, absolutely not. We're not saying Arch is bad. Th this is the same thing we were talking about last week when we ranked it a little bit lower in the tiers, is that it's not a bad distro at all. It's actually a really good distro. It's just not as for everyone as their community seems to make it out to be. You know, and, and well, I think I think the most important thing that we need to say is it's it is a it is a the reason we we like ranked it lower and the reason this might come off that we're saying it's bad is not because it's a bad distro. It's a good distro, but it's even better if you build off of it like Arco Endeavor. You can it makes a really, really solid foundational distro. It it's really, really good as a distro, no matter what. But if you use it to build off of, you can do incredible things with Arch. And most of the issues that someone would have with Arch are addressed in something like that, like Arco. Like, I mean, most people are using Arch because of Arco. It's the same thing with Debian. Debian is not a distribution that is for everyone. It's not as easy to install as you would like. They obviously have some very interesting issues when it comes to ISOs and their main maintenance of literally 10,000 different ISOs and a horrible website and all that stuff, right? So it's not... Their, their way of doing things is completely different. But Debian, as Linux Mint will tell you, as Ubuntu will tell you, as many different distros will tell you, is a fantastic thing to build upon. Because it's, it provides a solid base, it provides a lot of software for you to have access to, and then you can go forth and and do some of the things that you want to do in order to build a fantastic distro on top of it. But for the vast majority of people, Debian is not a distribution that you would recommend as someone who would want to use, especially if you're running on newer hardware or you're running, uh, you know, if you're interested in applications getting actually updated ever, you know, and, and yeah. Debian has a solution. They have testing. They have SID, all this stuff, right? And it's possible that if you want newer packaging, you can get those things. But you have to go search that stuff out. The vast majority of people are just using the regular Debian ISO, and that's their stable version. And I think for most... For, for, Arch and Debian are in the same sphere, and that is that they make very good base distros where e other developers can then build on it and create tools for them and create different user experiences than what those offer. It doesn't mean that those are bad distros and that you can't use them. You can. I think that I could be very, very happy on, on Debian, but I wouldn't put just a regular person on Debian because I think that they'd have more problems than they would if they were on, on say, Ubuntu or Linux Mint. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think kind of what, like the whole point of what we're saying is, is both Debian, both Arch have, they're great, they're great distros, but they have pain points and there are better derivatives that address those pain points while still having the quote unquote solid foundation. Like, cause Arch, some people would say we're talking about stability, not being a good, like a good thing inside of Arch that doesn't that doesn't mean it's a bad foundation because if you don't care about reliability, you want a dev environment, you want, you know, newer packages, all that stuff, then that might not be a pain point for you. But for a lot of people, that is going to be a pain point. So yeah, that's kind of the point. But also the two, the couple of comments I mentioned earlier that were like really good is someone said, people need to realize that there are people who use Linux not to feel special. There are not, uh, there are people who are not in comment sections every day and who use arch for practical non elitist reasons. That's true. And the, I think the whole point of what we've been saying is for, for most people, practically speaking, there's going to be better arch derivatives that are going to, going to make your system more practical to use for the reason you would choose Arch. And also Milo said, Arch is still the best way to, to try new things. It's the best and easiest distro to run Hyperland and all the latest fix and updates. It's also the king of window managers. Like he's going on about Hyperland there, but to the point of where we're talking about how Arch has kind of lost its specialty is Milo's comment used to be true. Like that, used to be true. Arch was the best place to try out new things that are like constantly in development, constantly getting updated like Hyperland. Nowadays, that's not true. 
I cannot tell you, like, it, I, I'm not trying to shill Nix OS here. It's just the best example for this. With Nix OS, you get the latest Hyperland, all that stuff. But installing it, you don't have to make sure you get the portal. You don't make sure, like, you don't have to make sure you get all of the necessary dependencies, not to get Hyperland to work, but to have a working Hyperland environment, working Wayland environment. You just enable it with a single option. Hyperland programs.hyperland.enable equals true. So a lot of the a lot of the reasons that you might pick Arch, there are now other distros that are competing in that same market and are either better in a certain way or worse in a certain way than Arch. And so I don't know, Arch is still a great distro, but I think there are definitely more alternatives for people to pick that make it harder to just say, yes, it's objectively a great distro and you definitely should go use it because now it's a great distro, but is it right for you? Yeah. Uh, Steve, thanks for the $2 super chat. Sorry, I missed it when it was scrolling by. And also we stole your, 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 your topic there. Uh, he says Arch is a good base for building one's ideal OS. <laughs> we, we, we said that we, we, we stole it from you. Good ideas and all that stuff. Anyway, anyways, thank you for that. Someone asked what the most stable distro that I've ever used was and I have to say that it's OpenSUSE. It just but I Okay, so I know people think that I'm an OpenSUSE shell and I think that people are coming to think that that Tyler is a NixOS shell. So we're we're just a bunch of shells here and and I think that in Tyler's case it's true. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, no, I'm uh, also, not even going to deny that uh, one. Uh, sticker. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I I I I think that people uh, seem to assume that because I tout OpenSUSE all the time, I think that it's perfect. I do not. I made a whole video bitching about how slow Zipper is, and that pissed people in the OpenSUSE community off because they say that Zipper is not slow. Apparently, it's just me. I don't know. But uh, okay, right, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I have other complaints about Zip about OpenSUSE. The repositories for OpenSUSE are vast, and if you add in the OBS and you and you can install all that stuff with OPI, which I really enjoy, but it has a PPA problem. You know, where it has a whole bunch of stuff in the OBS that's really astonishingly old, and you have to be very, very careful with adding stuff from the OBS. Also, as you add more and more stuff from the open build service, you gain a situation where you're on Ubuntu adding a ton of PPAs. You have a ton of repositories on your system. Right now, I have like 19 repositories on my system. Now, those are just ones that I wanted to keep. If I had kept every one from the OBS that I've added over the course of the last six or seven months, it would have been even more than the 19 repositories that I have. And that is an issue for me because it... it causes zipper to be even slower than it is out of the box which is a, an amazing thing to say so i have issues with open just like i have issues with every distro there's not a perfect distro out there and i think that w w just something that we can talk about that we've talked about before we can talk about it again is that when people have a favorite something they get very offended when you say something negative against it and i'm the same way when Darth Vader got on my Discord this morning and said he's hopped to Nix. I felt betrayed because he he is my bud and he switched to Nix and he was an Alpensusa. But it's an irrational response to feel betrayed about what somebody else uses. Okay, Tyler uses Nix OS. I personally don't think that I could use Nix OS as my daily driver. I've tried. I've, I'm in the middle of a long term review right now. I have many qualms about it. I can't wait to put that, that review up there because I'm going to piss even more people off about it because I guarantee the Nix community is not going to like what I have to say. But just because he uses Nix OS doesn't mean that I'm going to unfriend him and kick him off the podcast. That'd be silly. You know, it's just, it'd be stupid, right? Because we... He tried that, yeah. but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's just, it's not... People get very, very attached to the things that they use, and that's good. I think that having passion for the things that you enjoy in life are a good thing, as long as it's in, as it's in moderation, and you don't inflict that passion on other people without consent, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. The yeah, I think your your point is completely true, and the the problem that we have in the Linux space is anytime someone is talking about something that they enjoy, that they run, or, you know, since they run it and 
they want to promote it because they like it, it's that it's instantly like a derogatory, like it has to be, we talk about people who promote things that they enjoy in an instantly derogatory way, which shouldn't like, just because you like, like for you, you love open Sousa. You talk about open Sousa, not all the time, but quite a bit. Cause that's what you use. Like you like it. Exactly. So I don't see, I don't see why we, that has to be a derogatory thing. Like why that that's a bad thing. If you like, Let's say you went out, you spent the money, and you bought yourself a nice, I don't know, Toyota SUV. You freaking love the thing, and you talk about how nice your Toyota whatever is from time to time. Like, not all the time. Like, you're not doing it to an annoying degree. There's a difference between an annoying degree and, like, just bringing it up in conversation that is completely related to the topic of what you drive. Like, I don't think that's a problem. Like it's not, I, I, I do think that your point of people get way too passionate and take it as a, an affront to them personally, when you use something else, that's the problem. That's why no one can promote or talk about what they like to use in a reasonable sense, because immediately, like, let's for, let's say we had never met and we're in a conversation in like this call. We've never met, and we're just talking about Linux. And then you start talking about OpenSUSE, why you run it, and why you think people would benefit from running OpenSUSE. In most cases, the person in my shoes would immediately go, well, I run NixOS, and then it turns into this, like, instead of a conversation that's general about why people would use yours, like what I use my, it instantly becomes an argument and like over which one, like one of us now needs to convert the other one. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's so stupid because really all distros are is a package manager and, and a pretty theme for the most part. Now, NixOS is, yeah. for NixOS is different because it, of course it is. And they gotta do everything different. Well, but, but there's, there's other distros that are completely different. Like we could go into like, you know, the, is it Bedrock Linux? The one that like lets yeah, you do all the package like, managers? Like, there are those weird yeah. outliers, right? That do things in, in a different way and are, have a different purpose. You know, you could argue that a lot of the immutable distros do things in a slightly different way and for, for different reasons. But uh, uh, generally speaking, a Linux distro is just a set of packages on top of a Linux kernel that some maintainer has decided to give you, right? And, and they've given you tools to manage those packages, and every distro has decided to change the tools. You're basically... It's, it's like having two different milk jug... And this is going to be a really fucking stupid metaphor. Just prepare for this. You have two different milk jug factories. They're both making milk, jug, milk jugs that look exactly the same, but they have different machinery to make them. Right, you know, one's maybe more efficient, it's a little bit faster. One uses less plastic, whatever. I told you it was a stupid metaphor. Just going in, just fucking deal with it. <laughs> but but you you get the idea, right? That they make the same thing. The, the the outcome is exactly the same. They both run the exact same way, but they have different tooling and stuff that goes along into the process. And that's basically generalized the way Linux is supposed to work, which is why, for the most part, it, it's so weird that people get so offended when one person doesn't use what they use. Because I use OpenSUSE, another person might use Arch. If we're having a debate, there is very little difference between the way Arch and OpenSUSE actually work day to day. They use a different package manager, they have different repositories, that's it, okay? That's it. Okay, they, they both use the Linux kernel. They have different access to versions of the Linux kernel at certain times because OpenSUSE holds their backs, but it's the same fucking kernel. It's not any different one way or the other. Okay, they both use the GNU core utils, exact same version as far as I'm aware. They both use systemd out of the box. It's the same version of systemd, version 200 or 800 or whatever the hell they're on now. Systemd does versioning really fucking weird, by the way. Just never delve into that. I <laughs> just completely off. But but anyways, you know, you know, so the fact that me and an Arch user could get into a fight over which one's absolutely better is really weird. But we did it anyway for an entire podcast today. We're basically saying that Arch Linux is not for everyone, but 
I, I think that the conversation boils down to not whether or not is it a good distro, but is it who is it good for? And that's kind of what we've been talking about is is that who are the the audience for Arch Linux feels like it has shifted from one place to another where it it, it it's just become a normal distro now. It's not really as for, as much for enthusiasts as it once was, because it was very much for enthusiasts for a very long time, because you know because of the installation, because of the AUR, all that stuff. But now it's just kind of like a normal distro that does things in a really it does things in a way that may not make it as good for uh, again I'm going to use this word, but normals as you as it used. To, you know, as people think that it once was, but I, I, what I find interesting about this whole thing is that the the Linux community does some, does weird things and does this with window managers for sure. I have I, I have documented the proof of this, but if, if if you follow Unix porn, I've talked about this before. And if you if you followed Unix porn for any amount of time, you'll have seen trends, basically fads, as people go through different. Window managers. At one point, everyone and their brother was using i3. Fantastic window manager, right? And then too many people started using i3, so a small portion of those people who are very not wanting to go with the crowd decided they're going to use BSPWM. And then everyone decided they're going to use BSPWM. And that got too popular, so people moved on to DWM, and they, then they moved back to Xmonad, and they moved to Awesome Window Manager was big for a while. Now, right now, right now Hyperland is the hot shit. Distros kind of do the exact same thing. For the longest time, Arch was the golden child of the Linux community. Like if you used Arch, you were proud of it. You touted it to everybody. Every you were it was in every conversation, right? These days, it's NixOS that's kind of in the in, in the in the in the in the limelight. Every everyone's talking about NixOS if they use it, right? And this thing tends to happen where the thing that used to be the hot shit just kind of goes into being the normal thing like it's just normal and while we've mentioned many things over the course of this conversation about why arch has lost some of its specialness and i think that all that stuff is true it's just some some of that has to be just contributed to people taking it for granted taking it for not necessarily taking it for, granted, for getting used to it being around it's always been yeah. around for a long time but just they have gotten used to, it, it's no longer Something that, go ahead. No, like you, your point is so true. Like, think about it. The people in the in the Unix porn subreddit, the people who use Arch primarily, what are these people? Tinkerers. They like tinkering. They like playing around with a system. That's like what they enjoy. They find it fun. If you tinker around with something for four years and you get it to a point where you couldn't be happier with it, and you want to still tinker, what do you do? You try something new. Like, and I, I, I think people get upset by that. Like, I, which I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't think any, just because you have a distro or something that's mainly oriented towards the type of people who would like to tinker with their system and people start tinkering with something new, doesn't mean the old thing is dead. Like, Development on Xorg has pretty much completely dried up. There are still people using Xorg. There will still be people using Xorg five to 10 years from now. Even if programs stop supporting Xorg, there will be like a new project spawned, a backport, like programs and support to Xorg. Like there will always be the old things to go back and tinker with and play with and use on a daily basis. Like, I don't think progress or I, I don't even know that I would call it progress, but just new things, a new shiny toy denigrates or removes the old toy you had. Like, I mean, I have, I have an old, one of those silver Nintendo DSs. I never play on it like regularly ever but it i'll go grab that thing and have a good a day or two of playing like old call of duty modern warfare on a nintendo ds that's fun like it's a good time i don't i don't know i mean retro gaming is a is a huge 
industry nowadays. Like the, the people making dedicated consoles and stuff like that. For us. So that's the the X or thing is is an interesting kind of conversation because you're right that people will use it for a very long time, and they'll probably even create translation layers similar to like what X Wayland does on Wayland, but for X org, so you can use Wayland things on Xorg. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that already exists, to be honest with you, if it's, you know, exactly. so um, people have a tendency to do that. Right. And the, the interesting thing about when it comes to arch is that I don't think that they're, so, so there's, there's two things to talk about here. We, we, we should talk about the documentation because their wiki is a big thing. Right. But um, in terms of their developers, I don't think that their developers do, do their popularity any favors because they're, they're very, um, they're a bunch of prickly folks, if, if you, if you will. They have a, uh, they don't do a, they're kind of like, like we, we talked about this, I think a couple of weeks ago where uh, the community management of some of the distros, like maybe it wasn't even us, maybe it was on a different podcast. I don't even know, maybe I'm just imagining it or something, but someone was talking about how, so, how developers are, should stay developers and that they should have like basically PR departments because the developers don't do a good job of PR. They don't, they don't do a good job of managing their reputation. And normally that uh, normally that's a sentiment I would agree with. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I think that the shining example of this in some cases is the arch devs because they don't, they don't care about managing their reputation at all where right? they just let it do things. And when they make a mistake, they fix the mistake it usually happens very, very fast. Sometimes it doesn't happen, and you end up with, you know, what, you know, GCC or G, whatever it was, uh, you know, not updated for ages and ages. You know, so usually they fix the, but they just post the fix, and then they are shadow people the rest of the time. You, you don't see them in the background. You don't hear about them in the background. They don't do social media. I mean, they have their conversations and stuff amongst themselves, which are public for the most part. Uh, you know, in their mailing lists and stuff and such, but un unlike other distros, like the Debian people, they're out there and about, they have events, they have conferences, they have, you know, all the stuff in their forums and on, on various social media platforms, Canon, the canon canonical guys, they're out there and about Fedora, obviously out, out and about making waves and cleaning up after Red Hat's mess, the OpenSUSE guys out and about, right? And, you know, whatever. Arch guys, you don't see them very often. Like, unless you're trolling around the actual, like, Arch forums and stuff like that, that's where they live, and they don't branch out. At least, I mean, that's just the way that I, it feels like to me. is like, they just don't... No, you're right. You're right. Because in the entire time I've used Arch, in the entire time you used Arch, did you ever hear about an Arch conference? No, never. Nope. Yeah. Never. I got invited to a Nix conference after I like after a month of using Nix and like talking about it publicly. Never once got invited to an Arch event. Like now, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that as a denigration to Arch, but that's kind of my point, or to, or kind of backing up your point. There is there's a lot of other communities out there that are very active, like and doing cool things to get the community to have um, kind of a cohesive layer to it. Like everyone's kind of on the same, the same page with arch. If, if, if there's 16 different groups, all with their own complete independent, like philosophy or, you know, design approach or wants out of arch, they all exist simultaneously and they interact like there's no difference between them which is kind of a problem. And add on top of that, that like the part of it is because of how they're based. Like, so like the, the canonical guys that with, with Ubuntu, they interact with, you know, they interact with the Linux mint guys. They have all these flavors. They interact with the Debian guys. They interact with basically a whole bunch of, you know, the, the Gnome guys and the KDE guys. And the, it feels like a community that are interacting and, and, and cooperating with each other. Where Arch feels very isolated and solo. It doesn't feel like they don't embrace their 
offshoot. So if, if you're using a, a, a derivative of Arch and you go there for support, or if a developer yes. who's, who's maintaining a Arch distro goes there and tries to, you know, get support from them, you good luck with that because they're very instantly, it, it, it's very much Arch only none of the derivatives matter they, go, I mean, they go to an arch go to an arch forum or any arch community and ask ask them how to fix your problem running arco that is the fastest way to have a bad day like i mean sure you might get help from some nice people. Only way it gets most faster is if you tell them you're using Manjaro, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that's the only yeah, way that, that it gets better. worse for you is if you tell them you're using Manjaro. It, it, but, and that's not just... The developers have fostered that community because the community acts that way because the developers act that way. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. It just feels... I was going to say it feels like a cult. But it's it's not it's not actually like that bad, but it just feels very insular in, in the fact that they don't interact well with others, and it feels like that causes them to stand apart from everyone else. Where, um, well, yes, you can be an OpenSUSE fan, or you can be an OpenSUSE developer, or you can be a you know a, an Ubuntu developer or fan or whatever, and you know you're you're that thing, and you have the passion for that particular distro, but you also have people around you who use other things that are either based on the thing that you're using or very similar to it. And you don't feel cut off from those other people, even if they use something different. And while, you know, people fight or whatever and, and about the things that we talked about earlier with the whole passion thing. But with Arch, if you use Arch, specifically use Vanilla Arch, you feel, or at least I always felt kind of, cut off from everyone else. And I think that that kind of added to the superiority that a lot of people felt when they had Arch because it, it is so insular, so Arch only. Arch is its own special thing and it doesn't interact with anything else and it's a very solo community. And you can kind of get the sense that you have a superiority over people who don't use Arch. Now, obviously, that's not everybody. That's a broad generalization and is not fair to the vast majority of Arch users. The vast majority of Arch users are just normal, regular people, and you know they're perfectly happy with you using whatever you want. But there's, there is, yeah, you have to to admit that there's a certain segment of the, that community that is that way, and I, I think that the isolation of Arch and his developers plays into that superiority. And, and I think that the thing that happened that changed all that is two things. First, Arch install became a thing so that the installation was no longer a special thing. But second of all, the I used Arch thing became a meme. And it, instead of being something to be proud of that you use Arch, by the way, you became someone to be mocked because you were so proud of it, right? And, and every time I say pr proud of having a, a distrib uh, be, being a member of a distribution or a user of a distribution, people are like, why would you be proud of such a thing? I don't know, okay? I'm not one of those people, all right? But sh you can't deny that some, at least at one point in the timeline that we're currently on, there was a vast majority of Arch users who were very proud of the fact that they were Arch users. And that became a meme. And when something becomes a meme, it becomes something that can be ostracized against, right? People can say, hey, yeah, you use Arch, by the way, and you say it a lot, you know? It, it's, it's one of those things, it's just... I, I think that Arch has these, it's just, in a way we said that it was special, it lacked its specialness, but I think that sometimes it considers itself so special and that separates it from, or makes it feel like it's separate from literally everything else. Well, I mean, I would agree with that. I, I, I do think there is a good segment of, of the Arch community that does believe that they are not more elite than like some others, but they are more sp like special, like arch is a special distro. And I don't, I don't know. I, to some extent that, I mean, that mentality was at one time true. Like if you wanted to have a usable in-depth tinkerer system, like, yeah, you went with arch, but now that's not special. Like, and I don't, I don't think it, I think that's a good thing. The fact that Arch isn't special for having a bleeding edge, like 
you know, rolling release distro that, yeah, is a little bit harder to get into. It's a little bit more base level, like you're going to build your system. I, th I think having other options that are easier isn't a bad thing. I think ha having other things that don't make that special isn't a bad thing. And I also don't think it takes away from what Arch is. I think Arch is still a great distro. Yeah. It's just... I'm going to butcher your name, uh, but since Sinitar Thrax or whatever you you say, you seem to be hung up on people using Arch to be to be superior, even while saying it doesn't apply to most people. The, the problem with that is that the people who claim themselves to be superior by using Arch are the most vocal, so that they kind of dictate the reputation of everyone who does even if the it doesn't apply to everybody right it's it's the same thing for literally any community that you encounter the people that you encounter if the first person you encounter in the open SUSE forms or whatever is an asshole you're just going to kind of assume that everyone there's kind of an asshole especially if you have multiple you know interactions with different people and they all kind of treat you this with the same bl blunt and very uh disassociative manner or manner that's not the right word but you know if, if you have that experience a couple times you're just going to assume that that's kind of the way the community is and unfortunately arch has developed the reputation of being like that unfortunately that's just the way it is and like i i don't i don't see how we're hung up on it like this is a fact like it is objectively fact when you go into the arch communities you're going to find a lot of people who have a superiority complex like that's going to happen is that true of most arch users or all arch users no but are those two things like do they have to be like diametrically opposed no they can both be true at the same time like they're say there is plenty of arch users that do have a superiority complex. Is that the majority or all of them? No, like these things are both true and they, and definitely what you were saying. Yeah. They've gained a reputation of having those users. I, I, I also don't, I don't, I don't think we've been complaining about this. It's we've been talking about it. Like this is just something that has happened with arch. And there's also like, this is also true with most tinker, like tinkerer systems, like Gentoo. There's plenty of people who use Gentoo because they have a superiority complex about using a Gentoo. Like that, that's true. I, I, I'm going to say this and, and just to know that mostly I'm being joking, but the, the, the thing about the, the Gentoo is that if you install Gentoo, you have a reason to be superior. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but there are levels like if you install Gen two and you get it up and running and and you use it and it's fantastic, you have a, a little bit of a reason to consider yourself superior a little bit like maybe not superior but proud of that fact because it isn't it is a it is something that you have done that not everyone can do or has done right so it's something to be proud of but like i said there's levels so the people who install linux from scratch look at the gen 2 guys and like oh how cute you know it's, exactly. it's a completely yeah. different level and i i think that there's a difference between being just proud of something that you've done and, and then moving on to, to then there, there's a difference between between that and being constantly proud of it all the time and uh, I, uh, uh, Linux Tech Geek said that Gen 2 is not hard to install. <laughs> okay, <laughs> It's not hard to install if you've already done it. Uh, if you haven't done it ever before, it is uh, exactly well, hard to install. Especially if you well, have friends. No, no, hold on a second. Especially if you have yeah. friends in your live chat trying to teach you how to install it. And they're all telling you a different way. So, yeah. sorry. And, and right. No, yeah. <laughs> but not that I'm salty or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well to the point of like like when it comes to like being proud of something that you've done like gentoo i think a big part of that it normally it's not even that you're proud that you've been able to like get gentoo working and installed and like now you know how portage works it's normally like i have the hardware to run it and like still use it on a daily basis <laughs> like i'm not still compiling firefox it actually exactly. did compile you know 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> but but it happens within the the Gen two community too, because if it, it, I, you've probably I mean you've installed Gen two often enough to be to be looked down upon by for, for using the binary kernel instead yep. of compiling it yourself. Like yep. there are members of the Gen two community that if you don't compile your own kernel, they're like, why are you even bothering using Gen two? That's the entire <laughs> fucking point, right? Why are you using the binary? That's what that's why when they just announced recently were, that they were creating a binary repository where there was a whole bunch of people like why are you then what's the point of gentoo if you're just using a bi just using a shit ton of binaries it doesn't make any sense the whole point of using gentoo is to compile everything and use use flags and all this stuff right so uh, uh, that that pride and that stuff can be easily knocked down when you don't aren't using quite the hardest thing and i think to bring it back to arch arch used to be one of the hardest things even if it wasn't you know truly hard but these days, Arch install exists, so no longer hard. It takes away that pride point, right? And I think that sometimes the people who still have pride over their uses of Arch, which, by the way, you can be proud to have installed it, like, whatever, for a little bit. But continuing to <laughs> spew that pride all over everybody is not necessarily you know the best thing and the best image so uh what were you laughing about tyler so, sorry uh, just while you were talking there tgp put a put a super chat in thank you for the 20 dollars. and he said as an arch user please accept this as my humble token of peace and goodwill for my people <laughs> <laughs> thank you tgp for the super chat uh we're not alienating the the arch people i think we, we've been very clear on the fact that we love arch people we used to be we used to be arch people and i'd happily use arch again if i needed to okay i i tend to prefer other distros these days but i i think that you and i are both in the situation where if we if somebody set an arch laptop in front of us we'd be perfectly happy as long as it stayed running for oh, any amount of time right it, it's not like somebody set it in an ubuntu laptop in front of us and they're like oh god you know or, <laughs> or an elementary os laptop because we'd both tear our heart tear our hair out if we had to use that right so it's not a absolutely no way are we saying that either the arch distro or the people who use arch are bad people or are obnoxious the vast majority of them aren't even obnoxious they're just regular people and we it feels like by generalizing and saying that you have pride in arch and you you shouldn't talk about how you use arch is 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 it those generalizations generalizations are bad we, we 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 even though we've done them in this thing we, we we've generalized way too much and we should say we're sorry about that but i think the the issue for this entire conversation is that there's a certain segment of the arch community that gives that reputation and makes it hard not to generalize you know um, the way that we've done and, and i think just overall just to kind of wrap this whole conversation up to bring it all back to the general question is arch a good distro i i, I think that the vast majority of people, no matter whether they they're using Arch currently or they just they've used it in the past, would answer the question is yes, Arch is a good distro. But Arch is a good distro in the same way that OpenSUSE is a good distro, the same way that Fedora is a good distro, the same way that uh, I'm going to be painful to say this that Ubuntu is a good distro, that Linux Mint is a good distro. It's in the same way. Whereas it feels like previous that and we we talked about this that it used to be above like it felt like I, I think if about two years ago if you and i had done a tier list we would have put arch as an s tier distro i think we would have done that because we would have considered it to be a special distro nowadays you, you guys saw where we ranked it it just doesn't feel like it's that thing anymore now obviously feel free to to disagree with us because these are just opinions and uh, you know we're not we're not we we're we're not the ultimate authority on anything like literally anything like we we have no authority uh, whatsoever. Neither one of us have really ever contributed to the Arch community in any way whatsoever, uh, in significant way. At least I know I haven't. So yeah, same. We're just two random Linux noobs on the internet talking about shit, and that's all we can do. Anyways, since since we are wrapping it up, I I I do want to. Someone made a comment that I think is probably pretty good. What tier would you put? Would you put Arch today at? I think we were a tier too low last time. 
because we, we, I think we put it in the third tier down. I don't remember what the letters were, so I apologize for that. S A B. I think we put it in the B tier. I, well, I think we put it in the B tier. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd put it up so. in A right alongside Arco. I, I think that it's a, it's a solid A tier. I don't think that it's an S tier. I, I just don't. But I let, let, there's one thing I should talk about when it comes to the to the the tier list that we did last week. We were not as consistent with our reasoning as we probably should have been. You know, right? Well, and also one of the things that we were doing is we were comparatively putting them into the list. So, like, each subsequent distro was put on the list in comparison to what we had already put on there, which that changes your perspective. Like, if we're going to directly compare Arco to Arch, it's hard to put them in the exact same spot. Yeah, you know? Yeah. We, what we should the thing is i was just choosing distros from random from the logo list that's what i was doing what i should have done was we should have chose the 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 pillar distros like debian and arch and and you know gen 2 and stuff like that first we should have done those first i i think if we were to do it again we'd probably i i almost guarantee actually i guarantee if, if if in a year we decided to do the tier list again we would rank every single distro every single one probably completely differently it was just well other than manjaro but yeah Man- yeah manjaro would still be f tier <laughs> yeah ruby 79 x thank you for the the two dollars and uh i did in fact once use arch in a distro box i don't actually use distro box all that much anymore i've moved ma- mainly to using native packaging from the obs and just because I have, I would in fact use Arch and Distrobox again because it does have. There are some merits to the AUR being good. Just you know, it has the most software, and I, I think that that's not a bad thing to use it. I, I just don't think it's as special as it once was. So that's that. That's where we're going to leave it. So moving on to the Nuggies of the week. I, I still, by the way, absolutely hate that name. But if you want, there's actually a Nuggy t-shirt that you can go pick up. Shop.thelinkscast.org. It's an awesome t-shirt. And you should just go buy one. Because it's, it, 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 it would dull the pain of me having to use the word Nuggies each week. Speaking of those Nuggy shirts and everything, I wanted to ask you, do you have those in a 4XL? Uh, like oh, I don't know, dude. Whatever... For, okay. wh- whatever um, whatever sizes uh, fourth law offers yeah i, I don't yeah. choose any of that stuff the the only reason i ask is because i think s- some people were saying my sizes only go up to 3xl and i um, think it depends on which type of shirt that you that you choose because they have like four or five or six different types of t-shirts or whatever some of them have different sizes than others so you so you you kind of have to pay attention to it during the product setup. So Mario says, thank you for the $5. He says, since I actually work for a living, which I feel he's assuming that neither of us do work for a living, but since I actually work for a living, I don't have time to fix my distro when something breaks. That's why I use Debian. I think that you would find that a lot of Arch Linux users also have jobs, but uh, other than that, I get your point. <laughs> Anyways, moving on to the Nuggies of the Week. Tyler, your Nuggie of the Week, please. Mine is actually, I'm kind of really really happy about it. It's Westterm, which is a terminal that I had never heard about. I believe it's written in Rust. It's it actually looks really nice. Like it uh, it's not like themed out of the box like really, but it looks really nice out of the box. I I love the tabs at the top. The tabs at the top are they're just great actually since you've got me full screen. I'll switch over to my uh, desktop. And if I load up a terminal, uh, I can West. Why am I loading up a terminal like that? That's alacrity. West term. Do I do I not? Oh, I don't have it installed. Never mind. I can't even show it off. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's got nice tabs at the top, and it just it's actually really fast. Like I don't know if it's it feels faster than Kitty by a noticeable amount. Like I don't know if it's actually actually faster than kitty but it feels noticeably faster than kitty it feels like the output is like loaded much faster so i've been playing around with that just kind of messing around with it it's a very nice terminal i like it so when it comes to terminals i tend to ride mine into the ground so i use termite until it died i use alacrity until it stopped working and i'll use kitty until it stops working that's the way only time i ever switch to a new terminal is when i can't use the one that i'm on anymore 
So I think that's because I get very attached to the configuration file that I have. So like my kitty configuration file, by the way, is fucking awesome. Everyone should use it. Um, it's so good. It's it's minimal and just has a few lines and it's awesome. But um, actually, as long as you don't scroll down, <laughs> because the config there's a part in the configuration file where I have it like at the bottom that I still have some of the, the old stuff. So don't just don't scroll down. You don't need to see it. <laughs> Anyways my uh nuggy of the week so i've been talking so i talked about this the last two weeks in a row that i ran out of space for physical books in my house i have no more room for physical books in my house all my shelving is is taken up and it took a long time it took over almost 40 years for that to happen which is impressive but that means that i'm having if i want to keep reading which i read a lot i have to i've had to basically move over to pure digital books so i've been looking at tools now for uh, reading digital books. And I have two for you this week. So first off, just real quick, there's an app called Bookshelf on iOS. It's not available on Android, unfortunately. But basically, it's kind of like Goodreads, but without the social aspects. Basically, it just allows you to track what you read, rate what you read, and you can kind of get some stats, right? Uh, it's very good. And the reason why I'm... Uh, I'm saying I don't think that it's the best app that does this because I think that some social aspect would be nice, and I think that there are some stats that it doesn't have that would also be nice to have. But the developer of that application is probably the most responsive, proprietary developer that I've ever met in my entire life. Like I've had literal conversations with this guy about features, and like the next day, those features are there. Uh, I've I've reported like two or three bugs. The next day, the bugs are fixing, and th that means he he's fixed the bug, submitted the update to Apple, and had it released usually within 24 hours. It's fucking magic. I don't know what the hell, I don't know what relationship he has with Apple, uh, whatever, but it's just been the best experience I've ever had with someone who does proprietary software, and it's it's great. Anyways, that's called Bookshelf. But the one that I want to talk about really is called, it's called the, oh, I'm gonna get the name. The name it's called the Overdrive for Libby plugin for Calibre. Now, Calibre is an open source application that allows you to manage your ebook library and read ebooks, uh, or magazines, or manga, or anime, or whatever you're doing, right? And it's as it's as itself, it's really really good. It's not the best UI ever, but it's good. But the Overdrive for Libby plugin basically allows you to have access to your Libby account, which is attached to your library card, which means that you can search using that plugin for anything that's available in digital form at your library within an open source piece of software and then read it in that open source piece of software. It is amazing. I actually supported the developer on, on Kofi or whatever it is um, because it's just an amazing, it's kind of an amazing feeling to be able to basically rent a library book on your Linux machine. I mean, it's just kind of magic. So I, I will say that if, I, I will just tout Libby again. If, if you are in a place where Libby is a thing, get yourself a library card and use it because it's the best way to get books that I, in terms of digital books that I've ever come across. So um, amazing. Anyways, that's it. This has been a fantastic conversation. We had a lot of people watching again. Like this is the second week in a row. We've went over 200 concurrent viewers, which is just absolutely bonkers. So thanks everyone who has watched live. If you want to watch this live every week, you can do so. We do this live every Saturday at three o'clock PM Eastern time or thereabouts. Today we we're a little bit late, but not nearly as late as we were last week when Tyler decided to build his computer five seconds before the, the podcast. He's never going to live that one down uh, like ever. Um, I, I, I will, I, I cannot justify the decision to r build a Xeon system for the first time ever, never I've never used server hardware ever in my life, the night before the podcast at like 1 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Can't believe that was a smart decision at the time. Yeah, yeah he did it anyways. Anyways, <laughs> yep. if you want to get in contact with us, you can do so in any number of ways. The best way is probably to head on over to the website, which is the linuxcast.org. There you'll find previous episodes all the way back to season one. So if you want to binge the Linuxcast, you can actually do that. I, I, I can tell you this right now. Here's the funniest thing. So I, I talked a couple weeks ago about how I went through and created a page for every episode we've ever done. Somewhere along the line, there was a host for like three episodes that I completely don't remember. I don't remember this person at all. 
can't pronounce his name, so if you're even still watching, I apologize. I don't remember you. You did episodes with me, like four of them, in like season three. Don't remember you at all. Sorry. So that's how long I've been doing the podcast. I don't even remember all the fucking hosts I've had. So Tyler, just to know, if you decide you're not going to do the podcast anymore, I will soon forget you. <laughs> like, like, I, like, I, I was doing this, like, who, who is that guy? Like, I listened to it, like, I don't even remember his voice. I don't remember those episodes at all. Like, I've completely shut them out. Like, I remember Ricky. I remember Martin. I, like, obviously I remember you, but like, this, there's this fourth guy. I had no clue who, who he was. It was hilarious. But anyways, website the linuxcast.org is where you'll find all that stuff you also find previous blog posts there you can find tyler who does youtube videos every every once in a while usually on nixos these days uh, you can find that at youtube.com slash zanyog i'm still predicting that tyler will use nixos until uh, mental outlaw calls him out for using it and then he and then tyler will switch off i'm, I'm pretty sure that's the way that's going to happen uh but anyways you can you can make sure you head on over there and subscribe to his channel as well you can follow me on uh, youtube as well youtube.com slash linux uh you can support me on patreon patreon.com slash linux cast tyler's patreon and stuff like that will be on the website as well so you can head on over and find all of our contact information including mastodon and discord and all that stuff at the linuxcast.org slash contact all that stuff is there be the easiest way to find it instead of just listening to me ramble on about it for five minutes. Anyways, that's the contact information. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near without you. I, I just... There's the words. See, I, ha I did a whole fucking podcast until the end, and then I lost the words. Anyways, thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon, and YouTube, and Kofi. You guys are awesome. Without you, the channel would not be anywhere near where it is right now. There's the words in the right proper order. Good Lord. Anyways, thanks so very much for all those people. Thanks everybody for watching again live every Saturday on the Linux cast. Thanks you for watching you live. If you want to watch it afterwards, it's posted on Mondays in, in an edit, edited form, both on video, on YouTube, and on your favorite podcatcher. Make sure you subscribe. If you, you do watch us or listen to us via audio, make sure you leave a review. Thanks everybody again for watching or listening. We'll see you next time. Oi.